the past couple of years, the interest in lithium batteries has absolutely skyrocketed. But how does cobalt fit into the picture when it comes to lithium batteries? Lithium batteries, of course, used in everything from our laptop computers to our mobile phones, all the way to electric cars. Today, I'm joined by Joe Kataravik, who's the CEO of a small company on the Australian market, Cobalt Blue, stock code COB. We're talking about lithium batteries and how cobalt fits into the picture. It's a strange one because cobalt is usually a byproduct of nickel and copper, but the stock price of co cobalt has risen 60% over the last 12 months. So let's ask Joe a few questions. First of all, Joe, thanks for joining us. I just wanted to ask you about lithium batteries and in particular, how cobalt fits into the picture because there's lithium aluminium batteries, lithium cobalt batteries. What's the difference and what's the difference in terms of the popularity of use of cobalt in batteries? Sure, thanks, Julia. Um, firstly, lithium ion batteries have been around for over 20 years, so they're not a new phenomenon. Um, initially, they were present in uh, smaller mobile devices such as your laptops and, and uh, your iPhones, etc. But today, the broad need for lithium ion spans energy batteries, which are those which have a large degree of energy that can be stored for a long time. And that's typically, for example, a, a solar uh, battery style setup for your home or a power battery where the energy needs to be transferred from the battery to the application very quickly. And so, for example, electric vehicles. Um, would tend to be more power battery in, in orientation. Cobalt fits about three quarters of all of the lithium ion uh, technologies have a cobalt content in them. It's part of the cathode mass. Now you'll hear a lot about uh, lithium sulfur or lithium air batteries coming through, but bear in mind those technologies in general have been around also for around 20 years. They have various niches, um, but at this stage they still haven't been proved robust enough to displace cobalt bearing lithium cells. So cobalt effectively is a technology enabling metal, predominantly in the lithium ion space. And cobalt's not just used for lithium batteries, so what are its other major uses? Sure, um, just over half of cobalt um, demand comes from the lithium ion battery space. The other half is predominantly various alloys. Uh, predominant in that is a class called super alloys. So they're uh, alloys where cobalt adds strength, corrosion resistance and temperature resistance. A uh, very good example of that is in aviation, in airframes and engines. Um, but there are other categories such as magnetic alloys, hard alloys, etc. But all of those fall into the category of, of, uh, of applications where cobalt adds an additional property to the metal. And I believe that Cobalt Blue is the first pure play co cobalt company on the Australian market. Why is that and what are the market dynamics at the moment? I think most of the supply comes from the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. So why Australia and why now? Sure, let me take a step back on the cobalt market. Against the backdrop of those demand uh, areas we talked about, which we think is, is running at about an 8% uh, demand CAGR for the next 10 to 20 years, supply is running at less than half that, so somewhere around three and a half to 4%. There's two things to note with supply. Firstly, the overwhelming majority of the world's cobalt is mined as a co-product with uh, nickel and copper, and only 2% of the world's cobalt is a pure play like cobalt blue. Um, that also that predominantly means that cobalt uh, supply swings with the swing in the price of those other two metals. So it's really an afterthought of production of the majority. The other uh, issue to note is the ethical uh, nature of cobalt sourcing. Uh, almost three quarters of the world's cobalt comes from the African copper belt, and it's estimated that some 10% of the global supply comes from artesian uh, style mining in the copper belt, which has ethical and moral questions attached to that. So not only is there a, a fragility in that supply, but going forward, uh, consumers like Apple will look to ethically source their cobalt and wean themselves off that immoral or unethical supply. And where do you see cobalt blue as fitting into the market? There's actually a fair bit of cobalt in the Earth's crust. It's a bit like aluminium in that regard. It's just the economic uh, deposits are very rare. So as I said earlier, the majority of cobalt in the world is basically a co-product of either copper or nickel, and the vast majority also has um, impurities um, and toxic metals in, such as arsenic in its, in its um, ore body. Now we're none of that. We're a pure play copper uh, pyrite style ore body, which means we'll also give off sulfurous credit. 
Um, and sulfur is a, a precursor for fertilizer with sulfuric acid, etc. So um, we will be chasing the cobalt. Cobalt is what will be driving our, our uh, bottom line. Um, and we're a, a pure play in the sense that we simply won't be beholden to other metals markets. And at, at the moment, for example, there are a number of global copper pro uh, cobalt projects which can't get off the ground because their core, core metals um, don't stack up economically. And of course, with these smaller micro cap companies, the market's always interested in how much cash you have and also what your cash needs and cash burn is like. Sure. So we've just come to the market with a, uh, an IPO and an associated raise. We've raised over our 10 million uh, maximum uh, limit. Um, so it means net of all the expenses, we'll have over 9 million in the bank on day one. The next two and a half years is a, is a highly accelerated feasibility, series of feasibility studies. Um, the target there is to uh, expend about 10, oh, just over $10 million in expenses. Now the first thing to say is we'll come back to the market to raise that, that deficit in probably over the next two year mark. The second thing is to say is that accelerated program will allow us to come from today to a full bankable feasibility study and project finance stage um, and by middle of 2019. And finally, where do you see the company in one five years time and what do you see as the major catalyst for the company? Oh, look, uh, just to dwell on that a, a, a little while. Firstly, um, all world-class deposits have at least two core characteristics in common. Firstly, is size. So by July 2017, uh, exploration and, and drill program will deliver a cobalt resource that's capable of supporting a 20-year top 10 mine. So it's a significant resource. Secondly, is economics on a unit basis. The proximity of Thakaringa to Broken Hill, the availability of people and skills in the Broken Hill area, the main road that runs between the two, allowing all the logistics, the power availability. So Thakaringa will be a NEM bulk consumer of power and nothing is cheaper in mining than using bulk power to crash, grind and float. We also have a railway line between Broken Hill and the Spencer Gulf where our product will be able to go to market. All of those factors, all of those factors effectively uh, mean that Thakaringa is an industrial estate on the outskirts of Broken Hill. We'll, we'll lower our cash costs and combined with our scale will mean we're a world-class deposit. The catalysts going forward are firstly the resource upgrade by middle of the year and then the preliminary and bankable feasibility studies due mid-18 and mid-19. So all of that will unlock the economics of the business and I think shareholders can enjoy the ride. Thanks very much, Joe. That was Joe Kataravik, the CEO of Australia's first pure play cobalt company on the Australian market, Cobalt Blue, stock code COB. And I'm Julia Lee, an equity strategist from Bell Direct. I hope you've enjoyed this small cap CEO interview and hope to see you next time. Mm -hmm.